Okay, so that then completes the, um, I think that's enough said about that particular exercise there. Uh, anybody can ask something if they want. Yeah. Hi, Philip. Yes, hi. Um, so doing this homework, I was a little confused just because it's the first homework. Um, sure. I don't know how you want us to approach writing proofs for questions in this um, class, because on the one hand, I could write everything in a super set, theoretic, rigorous kind of manner, which I don't really, I'm not really familiar with, or I could just use like my uh, regular proof intuition when it comes to doing this, which is kind of what you've done for this question here. So I'm just yes. curious. I think I think it's enough to do something like what I've done here. Um, in particular, I mean, when you get to see the solutions, they'll go up on the, the website. Um, I mean, if you just copy the style of the solutions, which, which tend to be fairly brief, which is okay. Um, I don't necessarily want people to write a lot about each, each question, as long as the idea is there. Uh, so I think if you set out something like here, right, uh, this would be, this would be fine. Okay. Um, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't object to say just an explicit writing out of cl collapsing of the set union to just go, oh, it's the, it's nothing, nothing changes. I'm sorry, say it again. I wouldn't object to writing out. You wouldn't object to say just writing out. Um, so you, you had V1, power set V1 union. Yes. I would, you wouldn't object to explicitly uh, writing out those sets and yes. then just collapsing that just into regular uh, PV, um, just just to the, just making that equal, um, equal to the contents of the left-hand side, I guess. Right, so you're saying about up here at the top. Yeah, so I just wrote it out and I was like, um, I, di I didn't dive into the definitions explicitly, but I just said that that was equal to the contents of Vn plus one. Right. Um, I mean, it sound, sounds like it's all right. Of course, I don't know what you wrote, but I mean, it, it, it doesn't sound... It doesn't sound that that's uh, wrong to me. Um, I mean, I think the thing is, I mean, these questions at the beginning, these are kind of not, not exactly standard questions because they're just kind of sort of warm up, very kind of simple things about writing out contents of sets and so on. So they're, they're not terribly usual questions, but I mean, I think if you just write out something that's like this, you know, just demonstrate that, <clears throat> I mean, there's always two ways of us proving, you know, set A equals set B. You know, you can show every member of A is a member of B, and then every member of B is a member of A, and then the job is done. Uh, or else you can give some kind of reasoning, logical reasoning, as to why <clears throat> these two sets should have the same elements. And I think either, if they're just kind of cogently and correctly written out, would do fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, fine. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to then then pick something else unless anybody uh, has anything specific they want to ask. I mean, about this very first section, 1.1 and 1.2, are there any kind of theoretical questions about the material there? about sets and proper classes, are there any difficulties going over any, about any of the axioms? No, okay. I'll, uh, okay, let's look at something like, um, <clears throat> um, how would you answer something like exercise 1.5? Well, let's do 1.4 and 
Philip, I think there's a question in the chat. All right. What is the point of the universe of sets? Yeah, thanks for pointing it out. Um, the chat window is very small on my screen and it's beyond my paper, so I don't always notice when it's changed. Um, it doesn't seem to turn as much. Uh, I think the idea, well, <clears throat> the idea is that the universe of sets is something in which we can embed any kind of mathematical object that uh, mathematicians come up with. So if you like, it's a matrix or it's a, a place where we can kind of do all of mathematics. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that the analyst or the algebraist, you know, is writing everything out in set theoretical terms when they do their work. Right? But we'll see, for example, that the real line which analysts use, um, this corresponds to what we'll call a level of this V hierarchy, and it'll be level V omega plus one. And then functions from R to R, they will appear at levels V omega plus two and so on. So we'll find that mathematical objects sit there inside these, these, this V, this universe of sets that we talk about. Now, there, there, are very hu there are huge sets inside V, you know, which mathematicians don't normally bother about or would come across, but that doesn't matter. I mean, I think we think of the universe of sets as <clears throat> what we complete by seeing what we get when we use the axioms that, that we list here. And so set theory is then the study of that universe of sets, and it does function as well as a foundation for, for mathematics. I suppose that's a short answer. You want, you want to come back on that, uh, Max, or not? So that just, this exercise is just a simple thing about unions. Give an example of sets X and Y where they're different, but they have the same union. So this is just a, um, um, So this is just a exercise in just finding something simple that will be like this. No need to have a terribly complicated example, I think. So the one I have, and you may have something quite different, is just this. Again, using just examples from empty sets here. So really quite simple sets. And then you can just check that the union of X is the union of Y. And I think then you could just say, as long as you've given the example here, then you can just say, check the union of X equals union of Y. So, because these are quite simple things to look at here. If you want to do one six. So this is really kind of showing you what you have to do to answer the question, really. Show for any set X two things. A union of the power set of X is X and B x is contained in the power set of the union of x. So this is just an exercise in the definition of big U and power set. There's a sort of side question to B is, when do we have equality here? Okay. So 
So, solution. So it just is just a general point. Here. It's a power set of one set U is contained in W. Right? Then this is just a subset of W. So the power set of U is a member of the power set of W. That's not saying anything more than something about power sets. Okay, so now let's suppose I've got some uh, A in X. Okay, now if I've got any subset of A, again, this is just power set, it's just saying T is in the power set of A. Okay, but then <clears throat> T is also in the power set of the union of Because here, if every element of T is an element of A here, right? what is this saying? Every element of T here is, well, it's then a subset of the collection of elements of elements of A. Because in general, if A is in X, right? If T is a subset of A, and T is a subset of the union of, of X. Because what is the big union of X? It's a set of members of members of X. Well, here's a member of X. And T is contained in all of the members of A. So T is contained in the big union of X here. So if it's a subset of A, it's contained in <coughs> this big union here. So then T is contained in a power set of, this should be X here. Uh, so T was just an arbitrary element in the power set of A. So I've got that the power set of A here is then contained in power set of the union of X. So power set of A is contained in here. So the power set of the power set of A here is in the power set of the power set of B union of X. And I've just realized that I've answered one five rather than one six. Sorry, I've gone astray. <laughs> sorry, so this, sorry, I went off, off piste here. This is the solution to, to 1.5. Okay, so I did one five rather than one six. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay.
Okay, so let, let's move on. Let's not um, let's not go back and do one one six again because there are other things I could go through. So let's go on and, and think about um, ordered pairs or do something about ordered pairs. Okay, let me look at exercise 114 and there's something else I can say there about um, V as well. So V, this is the collection of all sets. So it's the collection of everything that equals itself. We saw that V was a proper class, it couldn't be a set. So just for the purposes of the discussion, let V1 be the set of all singleton sets. Okay, so this is a subclass of V. Here. All right, these are still sets, of course. Right? But it's just a particular subclass. It's just the collection of those that are singletons, right? which only have one element. But this is also a proper class. And the reason is the same as why V itself was a proper class. Why? So again, this is familiar from the reasoning from before. Suppose that V, V1 here equaled Z. where Z is a set. We'd apply the axiom of union to Z and we get a set. Hi, somebody trying to speak? And my loudspeaker went off. Yes, I've gone off the page. But in this case, but you can just check that the big union of Z in this case is V. The collection of elements of elements of V1 is everything in V. Right? And we know this isn't a set. So this is not a set, so Z cannot be a set. So exercise 114 is in this spirit. It says let, looks like a big P, this is a class of all ordered pairs. So 
So what is P? It's the class of X, Y here, where X and Y are in our sets. <clears throat> Show that P is a proper class. Sorry, Philip, could you please flick over your paper and just go back to the last page quickly? Down here? There's a question about this? Yeah, I just didn't get all of it. Okay. Like the lectures, this should be up online, um, up on the YouTube channel um, overnight, it gets uploaded overnight at the moment. Um, is that okay? Yeah, that's cool, thank you. Okay, anyone happy? Right. Good. Show that P is a proper class. So again, th this is <clears throat> sort of combining that last idea with the definition of what an ordered pair is. So what is this? It's this. Now in general, what I've got here is around my X and Y, I've got these brackets and then there's some brackets around the whole thing. You should think of the big union operation as kind of stripping off a, an outer set of parentheses, an outer set of brackets here. Big union applied to this, this set here. This set has got one element. So it's a set of elements of elements of this set. Well, there's only one element in this set, X. And the set of elements of it is just X itself. So the big union is kind of strips off one layer of brackets around <clears throat> the whole thing. So now if I take an ordered pair, if I apply big union once, I'm kind of stripping off the, the outer bracket here. And if I apply it again, I'd get down to the, the constituents, the X and the XY that are there. Um, So what, what should I say here? So solution. Um, I think one should say something like that. So again, suppose for a contradiction, um, there's a set Z, which is this class P. So then we'll just check that the big union and the big union of Z is V. So firstly, by the axiom of union, the left-hand side is a set. So it'll be a contradiction if we do get. So we apply the axiom of union twice right here.
Okay, so clearly this here, this consists of sets. So this is a subclass of V. And we just need to establish the reverse. So I just pick any X in V. Then of course, X, the ordered pair of X with itself, this is one of the gadgets that ends up in this curly P here. But then, then you should check then that the union of the union here of P right, which is why I was calling it the union union of Z here. here. So X is in Z. So X is in union of union of Z. So we have the reverse conclusion here, and it's a contradiction. So I think that's almost more than you need to say to answer something like that. Okay, are there any questions there? Could you sketch the proof of the fact referred to in the notes after definition 124? The field of the R is UUR. Sure. Okay, let me find, uh, find this here in the notes. Um, right. So this is line 335 uh, there in the notes. Let me write it out larger. So what we have, the situation R is a relation. So it's a class of ordered pairs. Uh, the domain of R are the collection of the things in the first coordinate of R. So maybe R looks something like this. Right. There's a collection of first things and a collection of second things that make up the points in R. So R is a collection of points of the form X, Y. So here's something in the domain of R. And over here, these are the things in the range of R. So if I were to look at DOM R cross range R, that would be this box. So R is contained within this. 
And so DOM R cross range R could contain more than, more than R. I hope that's, uh, that's reasonably clear. <laughs> And the question is to check that the field of R is big union of union of R. So how do we define field? Field is the union of these two. Well, it's a DOM R union range R. And this should be a collection of things. So, so what we're trying to do is check the following. So intuitively here, remember what I said, when you apply a big union, you strip off uh, an outer curly parenthesis. What is R? R is a collection of these ordered pairs, X, Y. Now the field of R is the set of all X's and Y's. Right? It's something that come, appears in the domain or appears in the range here. So to get hold of all of these, the set of these X, Y's, I need to take the ordered pair X, Y and strip off two outer curly brackets. And I affect that by doing the union, I apply the union operation twice. Right? So, <clears throat> what, what can one say here? Um, if X is in DOM R, Then for some y in the range of r, x, y is in r. But then um, both x and y are in there. this double union of R here, because this here is and when I apply this big union twice, this will strip off the outer parentheses and I'll have just the X's and the Y's um, there. So what I've done is I picked an X that's in DOM R, right? And I've shown that it's in UUR. Okay, so I've shown that it's in field R. So I picked an X in DOM R, right? Which is how it could be in field. One reason it could be in field of R and I've shown that it's in, that it's in here. Right? And similarly, if Y was in the range of R, right? I just reason exactly the same way here, and I would have Y is in U U R. So this shows that the field of R is contained in here U U R. In that direction. Um, I think the, pre, the other direction is kind of fairly clear, right? I, mean, I think it's fairly obvious. If you take something that's in R, and as I said, you take the double union of it, then all you're doing is stripping down the, the ordered pair to be the X or the, or the Y here. So I think you can just see this is clearly contained in the field of R in that direction. OK. 
Okay. So let me just finish then. I'll quickly do one more, 119. Perhaps just the first one. Give a counter example. To the assertion that if I've got a function f, I might want to restrict the function f to perhaps a subset of its domain, right? F is a function. So, of course, functions are single valued. It's just a special kind of relation. So this would be F this relation here, where to any x there only corresponds one y. Now, the exercise is really just about making sure you've got, the, got it straight. You know, a function looks something like this. It's a set of ordered pairs or class of ordered pairs, which are single valued on each element of the domain. And there's actually no reason to think, okay, here he is asking this question, he's got some A that's perhaps this, which is perhaps a subset of the domain of F, not necessarily, but not. F restricted to A, recall, this is the collection of X, Y's, which are in F, but X comes from A. A doesn't have to be, just as an aside, A doesn't have to be a subset of the domain of F. A could be something much larger. But F restricted to A is that function whose, which is now F intersect F, whose domain is DOM F intersect A. F but whose domain is now A intersect domain F. So that's how I should think of F restricted to A. So this is a description of this, yeah? But then f intersect a squared. Well, a squared is a cross a. So in two dimensions, this is a box, right? Um, but we don't know anything about the range of f, right? That hasn't been, nothing has been said about that. There's no reason to think in general that you know, f intersect a squared, this will be a collection of ordered pairs first element from A, second element from A. So there's no reason that the range of F should be contained in F, be contained in A, sorry. So there's no relation between you know, this A and the, the range of F. So one shouldn't really expect this in particular. But you're asked to provide a counter example and one can scratch one's head over this and perhaps come up with something rather complicated, but I, in each case, I always think it's best to find something simple. So here is my solution to this. Very simple function. It's just got 
zero in its domain and its value is two. Now take A as just this. So in this case, actually A happens to be the domain of F. But it illustrates the point. What is A squared? Right. It's the set of all of those ordered pairs, first thing from A and second thing from A. Well, there's only one choice here. It's that. But f intersect a squared is clearly empty. Right? There's nothing in there. Uh, too many buts here, but anyway, there's another one. f restricted to a is just f, right? which is not empty. So just a simple counterexample there. OK, are there any questions? The time's up. OK, so I'll call it a day. I don't know whether this is a, a useful format for you uh, or if you'd like um, me to continue in this fashion. But as I said, if there's any kind of theoretical things you want me to go through, of course, email me ahead and or at the time and I can go through those as well. So let's try and make this time as useful for you as possible. Okay, fine. So I'll call it I'll call it a day then. Okay, thank you.